So welcome everyone. Wanted to thank you for coming and, and viewing this video today. I'm uh, going to be talking with Dana Stewart and Dana is the co-founder of Grinky Stewart and has been a practicing family law attorney for just about 16 years now. Really familiar with this and in the financial planning space, we don't you know talk a lot about divorce, but I think it's important uh, just on the pure divorce side, but really, especially on the inheritance planning side, because there's this thing called separate property that you can inherit funds and uh, it might not be considered part of your, your marital property. So that's what we're going to get into a little bit today and, and kind of go through that. So Dana, how's it going? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to do this. Absolutely. Appreciate you being here. So just some of the questions that have come up, I wanted to go through and I thought maybe we would get just an overall basic, hey, what, what's the divorce process? Just kind of familiarize people with that. And then we'll dive into some of those inheritance questions if that works. Perfect. Okay, awesome. So when people think of divorce related planning in the financial world, they often think that because they have a good marriage, it isn't applicable to them. Would you agree or disagree with a statement like that? Well, you know, it's a great question. And I guess what I would kind of um, relate it to would be, I've seen that before with clients who um, don't want to get a will done because they don't want to think about death or, or they're, you know, they're ultimately dying. And it's similar. I think some people are maybe afraid to even look into the way the property laws work in our state, because then in their mind, maybe that thinks it's leading them down a path of divorce. Certainly, I don't think it has to be that way. And I'm always a fan of education and just understanding how the property laws work in this state. So from my perspective, I think even someone who may not be divorced may not even be on the radar, but to potentially consult with an attorney along with a financial planner yourself, you know, tax professionals, and just gaining data, I think is always a smart move just to better understand what rights and options you have. Good deal. If, if someone is considering divorce or going through the initial stages, can you kind of explain what the process looks like? And is it the same from state to state? Because I think a lot of us, you know, when you have a friend that says, hey, I'm thinking about getting divorced. If we've never been through it, we have no idea what that means. So right. what, what kind of are the stages in that process? And like I said, is it the same in Texas as it is in Oklahoma or is, does it vary? So it definitely does vary. And I can speak on how it works here in Texas. So I don't, you know, I'm licensed in Texas, not licensed in other states, but not all states, for example, are community property states. And so there's a big difference, not just in the process, but the way that the whole divorce works based on the laws of that state. But generally speaking in Texas, so somebody is going to have to file for divorce, which a petition for divorce is filed. And that's letting the world know uh, that you are seeking to divorce your spouse. Once that's filed, the, there is an obligation to give legal notice to the opposing party, the other spouse. And so what most people know that as, you kind of seen the movies where the person comes to the door, they knock and they serve you papers. Uh, the, uh, that's wonderful. Yes, that, that's one way to give legal notice of the lawsuit, which is what a divorce is. There's another route, which we try to use many times um, if, we, if we're trying to take the path of hopefully least resistance and trying to keep the peace, um, where we can approach the other spouse and give them the documents we file and see if they will sign a waiver, basically acknowledging they've received it informally and that they are waiving their right to be formally served. And that can be helpful because sometimes people get served, uh, especially if they're served at work and they don't know it's coming. And, and that can really infuriate somebody and kind of set the tone for the divorce to be more hostile, where if possible, if we can kind of keep it from potentially going to court and try to resolve things offline, that's what we'll try to do. Now, sometimes you may have a domestic violence situation where you don't have an option but to go serve somebody. But the point to kind of answer your question you file for divorce, you give legal notice, and then depending on the situation at hand, 
you may quickly have a hearing to try to get some temporary orders in place, you know, deciding who's going to live in the marital residence, if there's kids involved, um, you know, possession schedule, child support, how other bills are going to be paid. So that kind of can happen at the beginning, either by um, a court order through a hearing, or maybe the parties come up with an agreement, you know, like we're fine with what we're doing and we'll just keep the status quo and put it in writing. And then usually there's going to be a phase of the discovery phase where we're understanding the attorneys are gathering information about the assets and debts that are out there. Once we have a sufficient idea of what the assets and debts are, we can move to settlement negotiations, which typically I like to try to send what we call an informal offer where I work with my client and we try to put together what his or her preferences are. We send that over to the other side, try to get the situation resolved that way if we can. If that doesn't work, we can go to mediation where we have a neutral party helping try to resolve the differences. And ultimately, if mediation was not successful, the last step would be a final trial. And at that final trial, the judge would um, grant the divorce, would divide the property, make rulings on child provisions, and that would be the finality of the marriage. How but successful? It's a, it's a very long answer. What I can do, I don't know if it would help you. I have a, we have at my firm a kind of a general timeline, um, a single page PDF I could send you if that would be helpful to, um, if there's a way to attach, I could give you that. And again, it's all this stuff is fact specific. It depends on what's going on in the case as to the exact timeline that, you know, the steps you may take, but I can at least send that over so um, everyone would have a general idea. Yeah, that'd be great. I, I can definitely um, post that with the, the article that I'll kind of put this with. So how successful uh, is that mediation step as opposed to going to, to court? Could you say that it works out that half the time it kind of gets resolved in that stage or is it more now it's, it's going to be going to court here? I would say generally speaking, mediations are going to result in an agreement being reached. Um, in fact, some of the mediators that I use, they've given me statistics saying over 93% of cases end up settling um, in family law cases. I haven't seen that data, but that's just what these mediators have reported to me. But I know in my own cases, the vast majority will end up settling. Sometimes you may get a partial settlement and there are still a few issues left to go to trial on, but the majority of the time we, we get a full settlement. Now that's assuming the case is ready for mediation. If we don't have the necessary information regarding the estate, we'll then try to mediate and settle and divide things that you don't even know what each spouse owns or may have, that's not gonna work. So the attorneys have to make sure they've done their diligence and compiled all the data, but then assuming that's done, then mediation is usually successful. And that's why a lot of judges in our area, in Dallas, the, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, will require uh, mediation before you can even have a final trial because they know most cases will end up getting resolved that way. Hmm. Interesting. So out of curiosity, this kind of came to mind. Let's say a couple lives in Dallas. They end up getting separated. One spouse moves to, let's say, uh, New Orleans okay. because her family lives there. Can either spouse file in those separate states or was it, hey, they lived here, they were married here, they were established here, it has to be filed in Texas or because it is state by state? Yeah, that's a great question. And so in our state, in order to meet the requirements to file for divorce, you one have to have lived here for the last six months prior to filing. And then you have to live within the county you're going to file in for the last 90 days. So in the scenario you're discussing there, you have the two spouses, they lived in Dallas, we'll say Dallas County. One spouse moves to New Orleans. Well, Louisiana, now Louisiana is a different beast because they follow a Napoleonic law, which is very different than what most other states follow. But typically speaking, there's still going to be a residency requirement before that spouse can be eligible to file. But if he or she meets that requirement, they could file there, even if the majority of the marriage was lived in Dallas or some other um, jurisdiction. Does that make sense? Yeah. Wow. So people might be flocking to states where they get more favorable. 
outcomes, I'd imagine. Certainly, you know, they could try it. I've had cases like that too, where, and normally whoever files first in that regard, that's going to be the venue where the, meaning the court that's going to hear the case. Um, and I've had that happen where people filed with just in like a day of each other, you know, one here in this area, one in Florida. And then you just look to see, okay, well, which was filed first. Sometimes you have to get both judges on um, in a conference to kind of sort it out. But ultimately only one of those venues would move forward with the case. Okay. Awesome. So the, property that's being split as well as you know obviously figuring out the kids and custody but just talking about property does it matter how it's legally registered when it comes to the view from the divorce proceedings so for example someone has something registered as uh, tenants in common or a uh, joint partnership all those different you know legal entities does, does that play into the proceedings of divorce and if so, how? So it can. It's like so many things in the law. The answer is it depends. But I think the easiest way to probably explain it is we are a community property state. And what that means in a nutshell is that the things that are acquired during the marriage are presumed to be community property, which means both spouses have an ownership interest in. And so you may have a situation where during the marriage, a, a home is purchased, and maybe it's only um, maybe only one spouse actually is on the, the mortgage. You know, maybe they had better credit or it was a VA loan, something like that, where it's just in the name of one spouse. Well, under the laws of our state, there's still a presumption that even though it may only be titled to one person's name, it's still owned by both of them. Now, there are, there can be exceptions to that. And this is where when people start getting into um, a situation where maybe they're thinking about divorce or even if they're just obtaining property, not even divorce is so far off their radar. I think it's good to consult with an attorney to make sure you're structuring things correctly so that you preserve your um, ownership interests. And I can give you an example of a case I had a few years ago. I had a gentleman who he owned some real property prior to the marriage. And so by the laws of our state, that is his separate property. And what that means is the family law court, the judge doesn't have the ability to take that property away from him. It's his separate, or it was his separate property. But during the marriage, he added his spouse's name to the, um, to, to the, the, the deed on the house. And there is case law that's pretty clear that by doing that, he had essentially gifted a one half ownership interest in that property to his spouse. And so by the time this case made it to me and I made him aware of that, he wasn't very happy because in his mind, he thought, oh, it's 100 percent mine. And so I had to explain to him that, no, it's not going to work that way. And so, again, the point I'm bringing up or trying to make is. Before anybody makes decisions like that, it's good to consult with professionals that can give you clear guidance on the ramifications of those actions. Because in that situation I just explained, there was no real way to undo it because his spouse was not willing to let go of her half ownership interest and she expected to be bought out from it. You know, And, and so it's just important to understand. But big picture, the way things are titled may impact. It really just depends. But generally speaking, if you acquire an asset during the marriage, it's going to presume to be owned by both of the parties. So that's a, that's a great kind of segue into, so community property assumes that all property kind of created while married is marital property. Right. But if you have property that you've had prior to your marriage, or let's say you've inherited from a parent, you know, they passed away, they put you as the beneficiary, and you don't jointly title that property. So let's say, uh, I'll just take my world, for example, you know, you are gifted or inherit a, an IRA. If that goes to one spouse, can they exclude the other spouse from that? So what's, what's kind of the rules around that? And uh, maybe we'll dig into when it, when it makes sense to do that and when it doesn't. Okay. Yeah. So good question. And, and 
again, like so many things in the law, you have rules and then exceptions to rules. And so there's that general presumption that we are a community property state, like I mentioned. And so the things that are acquired during the marriage are presumed to be owned by each spouse um, collectively. However, if you have an inheritance, that is an exception to the community property uh, presumption. So one spouse has great aunt Ethel, she passes away, he or she inherits an IRA or some, it doesn't even have to be a financial, it could be real property, whatever it may be, it could be a vehicle. Well, that asset is going to be that spouse's separate property. Now, if you have a financial account where people can sometimes get in trouble though, is let's say that it's a, let's use an easier example instead of an IRA, let's do a, a more liquid example, just maybe $50,000 in cash came from great aunt Ethel and wife received it. She puts it in a bank account that's only in her name. And this happens while she's married to her spouse. Well, over the course of the marriage, if she is taking other funds that are community, for example, her paycheck and putting it into that bank account that is only in her name and only had the funds that she inherited from great aunt Ethel, well, she is now commingling that asset. She's taking what was separate property and adding community property. So now it's mixed character and where this can get very, um, I guess risky or not even risky, just kind of a dangerous situation is losing some or all of that separate property uh, money that you had. So for example, that $50,000, let's say that you know, wife is putting in money, she's paying bills, just, you know, so like most bank accounts, the balance is going up and down. Well, at some point, let's assume it drops down to $30,000. Maybe they um, paid off some medical debt, whatever it may be. Well, that lowest amount in that bank account now most likely is going to be the most amount of separate property she'll be able to claim. Even if later the balance goes back up to 50, even $100,000, there's a great chance that that lowest daily balance of that account is now going to be the most she can get or claim as her separate property. And so this is where, again, it becomes very important for those, especially if they're inheriting funds to meet with professionals that can give this guidance because you want to really keep those funds completely isolated from anything that would be community property so that you can avoid the, the mixed character issue that I've just talked about. What about you said paycheck going into that example? What if it was something like their social security check? Does yeah. So we, yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm so sorry. Yeah. And so we can still run into the same issue there, you know, and so you want to be very calculated with that. And, and I've even had situations where let's say it was a piece of real property that was inherited or maybe somebody owned before the marriage. We see that a lot where two, two spouses before they're married, um, one has a house and they're going to keep it as a rental property. They get married, they buy their, their community property house and spouse A still has the rental property. Well, that is his or her separate property, meaning the court can't take it away and give it to the spouse, but the money that's earned off that, the rent, that is community money, that is income and it's community. And if that spouse takes that money and is essentially paying down the mortgage on that, on that separate property debt, they are enhancing the value of that separate property with community funds. And so now the other spouse can say, hey, wait a minute, I, our community estate has been enhancing the value of this separate property asset. We have a reimbursement claim where some or all that money needs to be paid back to our community estate. And those are what we call equitable arguments, meaning kind of fairness. So it's not guaranteed you're, you would get the reimbursement claim, but it's certainly a claim that can be made. And so it's just another area where someone may think in their mind, oh, I had this before marriage. There's no problem. It's all mine. But you can easily get into a situation with a reimbursement claim if you're not very calculated on how you structure everything. Wow. Would that also apply? Let's take, uh, instead of it being, let's say, a $250,000 rental property, let's say it was a $250,000 investment account that had dividends coming into it. 
Is that the same argument? That yeah, and, yeah, and and then it's going to get real, very nuanced with whether there was, you know, you can have like stock splits and various things like that. But ultimately, yes, income that's being made can potentially be off of that separate property investment account could still be deemed uh, to be community property. And so that's typically then when we're going to hire some forensic financial accountant to go back through and start tracing out because part of the issue you face, we are a community property state. And so if you're trying to make a separate property claim, the burden is on you to be able to prove it through what we call clear and convincing evidence, which just Kind of a side note, if you're looking at a, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt in the criminal world, it's like 99.9% sure, clear and convincing evidence would be about 75%. So it's a pretty high burden that you as the spouse claiming something as separate property has to then be able to show the court, you know, exactly tracing it out. And so that's where a lot of times we will hire a forensic financial account to help us make those claims, wow. to approve those claims. So are there any other exclusions to the community property rule? You said that inheritance is one. What about like proceedings from a lawsuit, for example? Good question. And so <laughs> it depends. So let's say that um, a husband gets into a car accident. Somebody hits him and now there's a lawsuit and money is recovered from that lawsuit against the person that drove their car into husband's car. Well, it depends on what funds or how those funds are structured. If money is awarded to a spouse for, let's say, pain and suffering, well, that's going to be separate property for that spouse, meaning that the other spouse doesn't have a right to it. But let's say that funds are awarded as lost income or wages. Well, income and wages are community property. Therefore, money paid to that spouse from that lawsuit would, for lost wages would also be community property. And so you may even have a, what's common is it could be a lump sum payment, but it's broken down you know, X amount for lost wages and then another portion for pain and suffering. And so then you've got to be able to show, okay, well, I took the money that was for the pain and suffering. And that went into some separate account. Cause if you just throw it into the joint account with where the paychecks are going and bills are being paid, as I said, in the previous example, then that money may be lost and you may not ever be able to recover it from a separate property standpoint. And then another exception would be um, things that are given or received as gifts during the marriage. That's also separate property. And so that could be, it could be a gift from a spouse. Maybe it's a, a wedding anniversary gift, uh, you know, some jewelry or something. It could be a gift from a friend, a neighbor. It doesn't so much matter who gives the gift, but things that are received as a gift are also separate property. And so you want to make sure if there is something that's given as a gift, one of the ways, again, the burden is to say, hey, this was a gift. It's my separate property, but you have to prove it. And so um, perhaps if, let's say, parents gave you a gift for your birthday, well, that one's maybe easier to prove. Maybe there was a birthday card that explained it. But we have a situation where spouses are going to buy a house and a family member gave money. And now the question is, how do you prove they gave it to just that one spouse or was it a gift to the couple? And if it's not documented at the beginning in writing, it can be very difficult to prove that. Mm. Wow. So let's say uh, an older couple has a kid that they want to support. They want to start gifting some of their estate. Um, they want to use their, their annual exclusion and give them, you know, $30,000, you know, one for each parent. But they're worried about the future and say, well, what if they have a divorce? We don't want to give all this money and then suddenly half of it disappears. It sounds to me like you're saying, well, they could give the money. It could be set aside in an account titled in just the child's name um, and, and designated as separate property, but then perhaps they need to consider how they're investing it as well and trying to keep it in something more like an ETF that doesn't have you know, as much income and just kind of grows and has capital gains built into it. Is that 
all accurate from your yeah and, and i think probably good matter of practice for anybody would be to keep all the monthly or quarterly statements on any of those accounts because sometimes if you know if, if people are married for a long duration of time banks don't keep records you know i've I even had some where going back past five years is sometimes difficult to obtain or from financial institutions and so, however, you could put the funds, it doesn't necessarily have to be in a specific account, like what you're saying with the EFT. I mean, it could be in just a general bank account. It could be in an IRA, however they want to structure it. But just knowing that you need to keep all the statements so that if you do end up in a situation where you're having to prove separate property and potentially trace back that you have the underlying documents, because if you don't have those and you can't show a very clear uh, course uh, as far as the tracing goes with the history of that account, you may lose some of that separate property. So I think in the situation you're talking about, if a client of yours wants to give money to their child who's a grown adult and is married, you for sure want to make sure that that money's going into an account that's titled just in their child's name. And then you could even go as far as to have that person, the, your client, write a card or an email, send something to document to their child, hey, I'm giving you this gift. It's for you and you alone, you know, not a gift to the spouse and you know, the couple as a marital gift. And then from there, making sure that that child is very um, protective of those funds and they're not commingling their community property funds with it. So I would think that that child would need to consult with a professional to ensure that he or she is doing everything they can to preserve the funds within that account as separate property. Does the, do the funds going into, instead of it being a gift to the child directly utilizing like a revocable trust, does that, make it easier to kind of delineate separate property versus marital or are we just getting into the land of mass confusion now? Well, it can. It's de I would definitely say we're venturing into the land of mass confusion when you add in trust, because then a lot of it can depend on um, how the trust is structured and can somebody does the beneficiary of a trust have the ability to take payments at their discretion or is it going to be outside of their discretion that can alter the classification of whether it's separate or community property. But so I think kind of better form of practice, you could definitely set it up in a trust, but then you'd want to get with, you know, attorneys that are skilled in trust to make sure it's set up correctly. But the biggest thing is just making sure that it's only in that child's name, because if you add in the child's spouse to there, now you've essentially given the, uh, from an optics level, it's going to look like it was for both of them, right? So if you structure it in a trust, or if it's just in that child's name at a bank account or financial institution, you should be able to preserve the separate property, but we've just got to be very calculated on how you structure everything. And so that, and again, making sure that there's no later any commingling of those assets. Gotcha. So would you say, what, what are the applications for couples who themselves may not find themselves, you know, any divorce possibility in their minds, but they're concerned about their children and their grandchildren wanting to protect them? Is there anything that they should be doing or thinking to make sure, you know, the right beneficiaries receive the money and it's designated in a way that offers some sort of protection? Well, I think the, the best thing they can do is the education piece. You know, I think what you're doing here is a great service that you're giving to individuals that are going to watch it because it's at least going to give them a baseline understanding of how this stuff works. But it's always, I mean, with the law, everything is so fact specific. It's all case specific. And so I think getting general information is good. But I would say meeting with people like yourself or a skilled family law attorney, a skilled estate planning attorney, and making sure that whatever goals that person wants to obtain are put into action and so that everything can be fulfilled to meet their request. That's going to be the biggest piece. So you can, you know, reading things online, that can be very scary uh, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. So uh, again, choosing people that have the legit credentials and experience, I think is where everyone needs to look to so that they get 
specific information about their unique situation. What about people who own non-liquid asset, you know, real property, like a business or real estate? Is there anything they should be thinking about in hedging and protecting against a divorce situation of theirs or maybe a business partner of theirs that, you know, you own real estate with two other people, but, you know, what happens if one of them, you know, is at risk for divorce? Yeah, so the business component adds a extra layer of complication. And that's usually where you're going to see in any sort of partnership agreement, there's usually provisions regarding what happens in the event of a divorce. Um, where we see this a lot is we'll have a client that is, let's say, a doctor. And by law, the so so let's say that this doctor owns is part owner of a practice with some other doctors, and all those doctors have spouses. Well, unless those spouses are doctors themselves, they can't legally own part of that business, right? It, it, it's not allowed. And, but that doesn't mean that they've lost their ownership interest in the business. So let's say that that doctor's practice is worth $100,000. Well, the spouse, the non-doctor spouse has an ownership interest in the value, so to speak. Although they can't be an owner on paper, there is ownership interest um, in, in what that practice is worth. And so upon divorce, that would actually, what you'd have to do is figure out what's the value and then try to come up with it either in um, an informal settlement conference or a mediation, um, trying to come up with a dollar amount that would be fair and equitable to give to the non-doctor spouse to buy him or her out of that portion of the money. But the biggest part, and that, that's kind of a somewhat of an answer to the question, not, not exactly, because you're talking about kind of what things to know, how to structure, I mean, getting a good business attorney for the spouse that is going to own the business. I, I think that's going to be imperative because you want to make sure you've got language, especially if you have business partners, if they go through a divorce, the last thing you want now, all your books are open record and you've got these divorce attorneys who are subpoenaing things and kind of dragging your business through the mud while you're trying to work and make money. And so it can get complicated. So I would say meeting with business attorneys to try to understand the proper way to protect your interest in the business is going to be very, very important. Yeah. So my, my example that I'm thinking of is uh, three gentlemen own a business. It's worth approximately $12 million. One of them ends up getting a divorce and it's a professional business that, the spouse can't own it just kind of like your example of the doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, you know, this particular person's portion is $4 million and hers is half of that. And there isn't $2 million of liquidity anywhere to, you know, buy them out so they can maintain the business as is. So their business was forced to sell to, to then basically buy her portion out. Is there anything from your perspective that can be done to kind of protect that? Because in the event of, you know, a partner dying or getting disabled, you know, there's insurance policies that we provide, right. but is, there's no insurance policy that covers divorce. Right. And yeah. It was not be really expensive. And I've had that situation before where the value, the, the one spouse's ownership interest, it, you know, it's to say $4 million. So then you're looking at 2 million or it could, you know, not everything has to be divided 50, 50, but essentially there's some portion of money, say around 2 million that the non owner um, spouse would be entitled to. And if those funds aren't there, there is kind of a risk for that non owner spouse, because essentially what we would try to do is then, structure a payout plan over time and then attempt to secure it with whatever collateral we could, you know, whether it's on real property or through um, a lot of times we'll use life insurance policies, but you do as best of a job you can to try to secure the payment of um, the or secure so that you've got collateral for those payments. Because otherwise, if you just say, okay, well, Spouse A owes $2 million to spouse B, and you put that in a decree, but there's no language on how to secure it, then that spouse may never get their money. You know, and unfortunately, the reality is even if it's secured, you may not get your money, but at least you have some avenues to try to exercise to then collect, you know, but, but those situations do come up and it can be a little bit um, 
it can be hard to deal with. And I always take the approach. I prefer to try to get my clients as much cash today as we can versus the promise of a dollar tomorrow. Cause you just don't know. I mean, I've had situations where the working spouse ended up dying, you know, and now they don't have the ability to, uh, to, to generate money. Fortunately in those we structured it so that there was a life insurance policy sufficient to cover the balance that was owed. But the point is, if, if you don't think about it like that, then you could end up in a big mess and you may not ever get the money that you were legally entitled to. Yeah. It's, it's often best to uh, approach things with the worst case scenario in mind. So that way you kind of hedge it off. Right. Uh, agreed. You know, and it seems like a, a self-serving comment for me to say, Hey, go consult with an attorney because I am one. But, but the reality is, Paying an attorney a few hundred bucks for an hour of his or her time just to get a general idea about what your rights and options are, potential consequences. I mean, that's a drop in the bucket as far as somebody's estate for for people who've got, you know, what you're talking about, several million dollars. (laughs) Even if you don't have several million, hundred million dollars, or excuse me, several million, and you've only got a couple hundred thousand, it's still worth paying a few hundred bucks to an attorney just to educate yourself because you want to make sure that you're doing everything correctly. I've had cases where people try to do things themselves to save money on legal fees And the consequences of that not only end up costing them a lot more money to try to undo it, but many times you really can't undo it. And so it's just better to be safe than sorry, for sure. Yeah. So sometimes in marriages, not all of the assets are easily disclosed like bank bank accounts are, right? What happens if a couple either has, you know, cash in the mattress or safe or gold coins is there anything a spouse should consider in these situations? Yeah, this comes up quite a bit, unfortunately, um, because you often see in a marital relationship, each spouse will take on separate roles. And sometimes one spouse handles the financial side of things. And it just, you know, that spouse is doing the financial side, the other spouse fulfills other duties, and they don't really think much of it until they end up in a divorce. And now the spouse who never really paid attention to the finances, has no clue what assets are out there. And that can be a very real, um, daunting, very scary experience for that spouse who doesn't have the information. And so, of course, there are ways that we can obtain information, the discovery process, we can send subpoenas out to financial institutions. But if a spouse doesn't even know where they bank at, you know, we would basically have to send out subpoenas to thousands of financial institutions, which just isn't really, you know, that feasible. And so I always recommend for people, even if your spouse is the one who handles the financial side, pays the bills, educate yourself on what assets you have. Save statements. Back to that comment I made earlier about bank statements, you know, figure out what life insurance policies do you have? Frequent flyer, reward point accounts, bank accounts, retirement accounts, even if you're not the one who's taking the lead on handling all the financial side, at least educate yourself so that in the event you're going through a divorce, that you at least have some reference to look back on. Oh, I know at, you know, at some point we had these five IRAs and it gives us a starting point because there will be a paper trail, but we have to know where to look. And, you know, unfortunately, um, even if you send requests for information from the spouse, they can lie, you know, maybe they're not going to turn everything over. And so we'll do what we can to try to find the information. And we'll even put language in a decree that says if later there is an asset that was intentionally hidden or undisclosed, that it's subject to be divided, potentially even given 100% to the other spouse. But you don't want to rely on that. I think be more proactive, educate yourself, save the statements, it can really prevent a lot of heartache in the future. What about the stuff that doesn't have a statement, though? I mean, if, right. I, if I went to this, the store right now and bought 100 uh, gold coins and put them in the safe, you know, how do you approach things like that or document things like that? Because that seems like it would be uh, very easy for one spouse to deny it, you know, existed. Oh, it would be. And we see it with cash on hand. You know, somebody will say, I know he had $5,000 and the other spouse, I don't have any money, you know? And so then how do you prove it? Well, sometimes you can't. And so I think in your scenario, 
spouse A goes, buys a bunch of gold coins, puts it in a safe. If spouse B is aware of that, then I would recommend spouse B taking photos or video, trying to document what's there. But if spouse B never has knowledge of it, then unfortunately he or, he or she may not, if they don't know that it's there and the other spouse is disingenuous about it and doesn't acknowledge it, that could be an asset that slips through the cracks. And I know that's not what people want to hear, but it's the reality. I mean, there's no way, it's not like the judge has some magic radar where they can tell everything that was owned. And so again, that goes back to just trying to be diligent and be aware of what's going on. But if somebody's trying to be sneaky and calculated, they could take a little bit of cash, you know, 30 bucks, 40 bucks here and there. And over time, maybe they've got it stashed away, like you said, under the mattress somewhere and the other spouse doesn't know. And Although we try to do what we can to uncover everything, we can't get it all. So that's where it goes back to the person just trying to be more diligent about their efforts to know what they um, themselves and the spouse own. Yeah, that's good. So kind of my final question uh, stems from movies. So in the, <laughs> in the movies, you always see someone that says, hey, I'm going to go interview all 10 divorce, uh, you know, family law uh, journeys. Yeah. So that way I can make sure they have, you know, conflicts of interest and my spouse can't. Does that exist? Is that even a thing? Yes, it is. So um, that's uh, definitely a thing that can happen. And there, here, here's why. So lawyers, we, if we meet with a potential new client, about a divorce case. Whether that client ends up hiring us or not, we are now prohibited from consulting with or being hired by that person's spouse. So if a in that scenario, one spouse goes around to 10 top attorneys in the area, consults with all of them about the divorce, they are all conflicted out from representing that other spouse. And so that is a thing that can happen. I don't know that it happens all the time, but I have seen cases where it, it has happened before. So it definitely, it does exist. Wow. Wow. So some, some things in the, the movies are true then. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those where Hollywood got it. I don't know if, you know, how many movies portray that's going on, you know, maybe they overemphasize the amount of times that actually occurs, but it is something that, that has happened in cases that I've seen. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, thanks for going through all this today, Dana. I think this Absolutely. is really rewarding and good for people just to know about whether, like I said, they're, they're looking for uh, information on divorce for themselves or for a loved one, or just educating about that inheritance piece for the future. You're welcome. And, and it's, it can be overwhelming to think about it. And I would just uh, let everyone know who's watching this, even if, like I said, divorce is not even something you're contemplating, just meeting with someone to better understand your rights and options if you do have questions is always a good thing. So just be proactive, take that step, figure it out. And then you get peace of mind, you know, and you know that you understand the way everything works. And so you can move forward with life and hopefully have a great marriage and never need it. But in the event you do, you want to know that you've already done the necessary legwork in the beginning to protect yourself. Yeah. And on that note, We'll have everyone's contact information at the end of this video. So if there's anything that either myself or Dana could do to help in the future, please feel free to reach out.